From epic battle scenes, impenetrable costumes, and impossible stunts, Marvel constantly has their fans' jaws dropping. With 98% of the footage from the MCU films being sent to the special effects editing professionals, it isn't hard to imagine how different our favorite Avengers look behind the scenes. But imagining and seeing are two different things. From Endgame to WandaVision and Peter Parker in between, you won't believe how dramatically different these Marvel scenes look without the power of VFX and CGI. Just a big chocolate missile. How iconic was this girl power moment in Avengers Endgame? However, while it may have come together seamlessly on screen, the arrival of the female Avengers took a bit more extra work behind the scenes. As you can see here, each Avenger had to be added in almost one by one. Some of them were included using special effects, and others just popped up from underneath the camera's view. You got something for me? Captain America's encounter with himself while searching for the Infinity Stones was already mind-boggling. But watching how they filmed the scene hurt our brains even more. Chris Evans filmed both parts individually with his stunt double, swapping roles between takes. The editors did their magic later on to make it seem as if it truly was a double trouble situation. I can do this all day. Yeah, I know. Although heartbreaking, watching Tony Stark's sacrifice again is worth it, just to see how it looked behind the scenes. There was actually no Infinity Glove, no battle raging around him, and no Thanos looming over him. Just RDJ's pure talent. This vision versus vision fight in WandaVision took a lot of work. Paul Bettany filmed this scene with his stunt double, and they later digitally enhanced his stunt double's face to look like Paul instead. You can also see that the upper part of Vision's suit, as well as the environment around them, was added in later with special effects. But I'm not the true Vision. Getting to see the true strength of Wanda's powers in WandaVision was epic, but the cast and crew weren't treated to the same experience while Elizabeth Olsen was filming. Without special effects, Wanda's combustion in the Westview Town Square kinda looked a little like an adult temper tantrum. But it's still impressive to think about how it all came together in the end. Oh, stop. Oh, stop. Oh, this scene had our heart rates spiking, but we're glad to know Tom Holland wasn't in any danger filming it. Behind the scenes, Thanos' ship was actually just a green screen wall that Tom Holland was climbing while attached to a wire and wearing a motion capture suit. We're too high up, you're running out of air. Yeah. That makes sense. The final battle was much less anticlimactic behind the scenes than on screen. The majority of the time, the cast wasn't even on set with one another at the same time. The day where the Avengers charged was when they had the most people on set, and even that pales in comparison to all the digital enemies we saw in the final cut. If you look closely, you'll see the Avenger army charged into a green screen. Filming Black Widow and her motorcycle was an event that included a Harley bike specifically created for the film, stunt doubles, and motorcycle cameras. For close-up shots, they would film Scarlett Johansson at a standstill, but for action shots, they had her stunt double weaving in and out of cars while two cameras followed in front and behind on motorcycles of their own. You always picking up after you, boys? Not all special effects are done with VFX, especially in the first episodes of WandaVision. They swapped out Wanda's red waves of power for strings, poles, and simple speed adjustments to achieve that perfect 1950s style. Well, please eat before it gets cold. Sorry to disappoint, but Thanos? Not real. Not even behind the scenes. In order to bring him to life, Josh Brolin had to wear a big motion capture suit, which made his battle for the Infinity Gauntlet with Captain America in Endgame a little awkward without all of the special effects. Captain America's shield was also added with VFX, meaning while filming, it was basically Chris Evans throwing an imaginary weapon at Josh Brolin while he pretended to get hit. All six stones, I could simply snap my fingers. Living on a land full of vibranium would be epic, but unfortunately, Wakanda was all green screen and special effects, including their futuristic planes. However, they still tried to make filming as realistic as possible, like the fight scene between T'Challa and M'Baku, where the set designer created a pretty realistic base for the shoot. Glory to Hanuman. 
Doctor Strange's cape for a lot of the scenes wasn't actually there. Benedict Cumberbatch would go through the motions of grabbing and putting on the cape, but it was added in later on using special effects. They just couldn't recreate how lifelike it was without help from the digital realm. However, in other scenes where it wasn't the main focus, it was just a part of Benedict's costume. Uh -huh. Mark Ruffalo has expressed in the past how embarrassing it sometimes was to be dressed in a large motion capture suit around the rest of the Avengers cast. While we admit it looks a bit odd, it was all so that the editing team could do their magic like in this scene with the Hulk and the Ancient One. He's wearing his suit, but also standing on an elevated surface in a green screen studio instead of New York. And Hulk. <sighs> Smash. It's obvious to see that the Spider-Man illusion battle was completely done using digital effects thanks to the company Framestore. However, how did they get Spider-Man to move so much like Tom Holland? Well, they made sure that they filmed the stunts and movements with Tom in a motion capture suit so that they'd be able to add the extra realism to the scene. Zendaya's part was also added into the digital sequence later on. We saw plenty of different versions of Vision in WandaVision, however, what we didn't realize is that for a portion of the series, he was actually blue. Avatar blue. The showrunners worked with the makeup department to find what color paint would look the best translated in black and white. Turns out blue looked much better than maroon, and they stuck with the color through every black and white scene he shot. Humans are odd. Valkyrie's entrance was intense, but when you take a peek behind the curtains, the intensity is… deflated. The horse she was riding was actually just an animatronic, and the area around her was completely green screen. Even Wanda's magical drop-down was done with just Elizabeth Olsen and a harness. As much as we wish these portals were real, those magic rings we see in Doctor Strange are actually just shiny metal circles with a green screen backdrop. They were elevated to give the effects of the actors stepping in and did help them meet their marks, evidently adding a little more realism to it all. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying this film. To get Captain Marvel in the air involved a lot of VFX, green screen, and major dedication from Brie Larson. The actress was attached to a contraption made of poles that allowed the film crew to rotate her and manipulate her in any direction they needed. This was all done in front of a green screen so that her powers, location, and even part of her suit could be added in during post-production. It takes a lot to make a superhero look fabulous. The Spider-Man cast didn't actually film in London, at least for this battle scene in Far From Home. The VFX team created a digital London for the film, while the actors performed in a studio with minimal props and structures compared to what we see in the final cut. Sorry to break the illusion, but Iron Man's suit wasn't actually physically there the majority of the time. Oftentimes, RDJ would just wear part of the armor on top of a motion capture suit. There were other scenes where he would wear a physically larger suit, with his helmet being the only part added with VFX. It really depended on what the script required of him that day. Is everything a joke to you? Funny things are. The Marvel creators got to spend extra time playing around with Falcon for his new series, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and we aren't complaining. They put in the work, researching and using footage from skydivers in order to get the perfect look for the Falcon's flying scenes. They seamlessly fit together raw shots and digital creations to give us these shots. Getting Chris Evans to look a lot smaller than he really was was a challenge. The production team had to go through multiple steps. First, the scene was filmed with body double Leander Dini, who still had to diet for the role. They then digitally replaced his face with Chris Evans in editing. Sometimes they would even have to scale down the actor compared to the environment, depending on the scene. Iron Man wasn't the only one with cool gadgets at his expense. We got to see Happy's plane in Spider-Man Far From Home, and we were just as impressed as Peter Parker. However, behind the scenes, the plane didn't really exist. While they did build part of the interior as a set, the majority was created digitally. Watching how they filmed the Rocket Raccoon scenes is kind of unsettling. Take a look. Rocket was, of course, created digitally, but in order to capture realistic movements, Sean Gunn, the director's brother, acted out the scenes in a motion capture suit. Because of the animal-like movements, he was able to replicate. The Vulture wasn't slick and fast, which means the Spider-Man filmmakers needed to make sure the Vulture's special effects portrayed his heaviness. 
It required some research on how humans look flying with jetpacks so that they could replicate it and then add in those digitally created wings. If you're not over how epic Black Widow is, raise your hand. While there's no doubt Scarlett Johansson brought Natasha Romanoff to life perfectly, it couldn't have been done without the added touch of special effects. So what exactly does Black Widow's butt-kicking and motorcycle riding look like without the help of CGI, stunt doubles, and VFX? We'll give you a hint. Drastically different. That's not up to you. What would an Avengers film be without an epic slow-mo walk sequence? While this endgame scene may seem straightforward at first glance, watching the behind-the-scenes footage will tell you otherwise. The VFX team played a huge role in the moment by adding in their white time-traveling suits. While filming, all of the actors, including Scarlet, were wearing motion capture suits instead. The special effects team actually helped out the costume department with this one. The design for the costume wasn't complete yet, so they decided on adding it digitally. Black Widow's big face reveal while acting as Councilwoman Holly had us shook, but it probably left you with a lot of how questions. Scarlett, along with Holly's actress, Jenny Agata, both filmed this scene separately on a green screen, and then the rest was left to the magical powers of VFX to sync and create that transition. Can you uh, give her a lesson? If you can impress Tony Stark, you know you're doing something right. Scarlett performed this entire fight scene with Happy herself. It did take quite a few weeks of training with her stunt double Heidi Moneymaker, but by the end of it, she was flipping Jon Favreau on his back like it was her job. It kind of was. Although Heidi did admit there was a part of the fight sequence that she had to jump in and film herself. The stunt included a one-handed cartwheel that led to her legs around his neck so that she was able to push him to the ground and flip him over. The truth is, during this Age of Ultron scene, Scarlett Johansson was barely present. Some shots were done using a motorcycle rig and an enormous green screen background. Others were complemented with additional footage that was added on with VFX later on. And Captain America's shield? Without special effects, it was nothing more than a tennis ball. The coolest part about the scene, though, might be the fact that Scarlett and her stunt double were made custom motorcycles just for the Marvel films. Stunt double Heidi had to take over for a lot of this epic hallway sequence in Iron Man 2. However, Scarlett was determined to film as much as possible and trained for four hours a day for eight weeks to be able to include parts that were all her. But it wasn't without some hesitancy from the actress. When I first saw the sequence that they wanted me to do and it was completed and choreographed, I just thought to myself, oh my god, how am I gonna do this? To keep her safe, she was attached to a harness a lot of the time. In the end, having her included in the scene added even more realism to everything. The last five years I've been trying to do one thing, get to right here. Special effects were helping out Black Widow right until the very end. Her trip to Vormir with Hawkeye might be one of the most VFX-heavy scenes she was a part of. This soulful adventure was filmed in front of a large blue screen with the cliff edge being a platform that was constructed in the studio. A harness and wire were used for the final moments of Black Widow's story. Excuse us while we cry for a second. Play it like some debris is coming down. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you, got, you can feel the blast. This. this Bucky car chase scene didn't look anything like the extravagant final cut we saw unfold on our screen. Bucky's actor, Sebastian Stan, wasn't even present for this part of the filming. Scarlett and Chris Evans filmed at a standstill in a studio car in front of a green screen. What makes the whole behind-the-scenes moment even more lackluster is that they also filmed without sound effects. They instead took directions on where to look and where to shoot from the director. The scene where Widow takes on Bucky single-handedly is another moment that looks completely different without the Marvel movie magic. Scarlett and Sebastian performed this scene themselves, but it wasn't without some added safety and effects. Scarlett was attached to a harness and a wire so that she could keep her balance on Sebastian's shoulder, and then safely get pushed off. Like the car chase scene, all of the action and sound effects in the final cut weren't present while they were filming. Payload secure. Thanks, Sam. Don't thank me. I'm not thanking that thing. Despite her dedication to stunts and fight training in the past, this moment was just a little too high caliber and dangerous for Scarlett to attempt. This means she was nowhere in sight for the filming of this sequence. 
It was shot with stunt doubles all around. According to the filmmakers, this helped the scene turn out more realistic instead of having to film multiple cuts, with shots of Scarlet intertwined. Well, you pulled this off. I remember a time when that seemed pretty impossible, too. Before Black Widow and Hulk kindled their little romance, things were pretty rough. Rough as in he chased her down while destroying everything in his path. However, for the filming of scenes like this, Scarlet would film with a green screen behind her. Oh, thank God. So they'd be able to add the Hulk in later digitally. The explosions we see in the behind the scenes were controlled pyrotechnics meant to imitate Hulk's destruction. Remember the huge boat featured in the opening scenes of Winter Soldier? Completely VFX. Check out this wild breakdown. For filming, Scarlet, Chris, and the rest of the cast actually just shot in a studio surrounded by a massive green screen. Scarlet still came flying in, but she was all decked out in a harness for safety, and instead of falling from a plane, it was just from her place a couple of feet in the air. I'm gonna get a view like this. We all know that Marvel didn't actually destroy New York City for this battle, but we also didn't expect it to be filmed the way it was. The moment that included Black Widow was shot entirely in studio with the actors surrounded by a ginormous green screen. The rubble of New York was added in with VFX later, apart from a few props like the classic New York taxis. Scarlett also had some help from her stunt team to execute all of the fight sequences she had. Who here hasn't been to space? Besides the actual actors, there wasn't much that was there during the filming of Black Widow's first adventure to space. And even then, Bradley Cooper wasn't sitting in the pilot seat in place of his character Rocket. Rocket, along with the entire spaceship, and Captain Marvel's suit were added in using computerized special effects. If you look closely, you can see the motion capture dots that Brie Larson had to wear in this scene. This earth-shattering, or should we say earth-blipping, battle in Infinity War was filmed on location, but they needed multiple blue screens to transform an ordinary field into the battlegrounds we saw in the final cut. They even have blue screen platforms to add dimension and help the actors by adding some realism to it all. With Black Widow on the front lines of the war, she was in the midst of all the special effects, like the Wakanda shields that were non-existent behind the scenes. Filming these moments took a lot of imagination on the actor's and director's part. Mark Ruffalo hasn't been shy about how embarrassed he was to have to wear a full motion capture suit while filming amongst the other Avengers. I've seen worse. But during this brainstorming sesh, it definitely helped out Scarlet. Having Mark act out the scene instead of just digitally adding in Hulk afterward allowed Scarlet to carry out a proper conversation instead of her having to rely on imagination. Far From Home wouldn't be the same movie without its incredible special effects. Everything from touching up Spidey's suits to creating the elementals required multiple companies, hundreds of people, and hours of work. So we'll spend this video breaking down their additions to the film and just how incomplete it would look without them. In every interview, he's like, when I wear the bubble hat, and I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> Far From Home's most memorable scene has got to be the intense illusion battle, the big midway fight sequence of the film. Framestore, the company in charge of this sequence, was given an unusual amount of freedom to create the scene. They weren't given a set script to follow. Instead, they were given the creative freedom to come up with the concepts for the illusions at the same time they were animating and adding effects to the shots. This gave them the unique opportunity to provide direction for the on-set production team. For example, with this shot where MJ is attacked by Mysterio. Framestore blocked out the animation ahead of time with a CG MJ, complete with precise lighting from the moon and lights of the Eiffel Tower. This rendered footage was passed along to the set production, who were able to recreate the exact lighting Framestore needed for the shot. This allowed them to slip Zendaya's performance into the final product looking absolutely perfect. By the way, the construction site where the battle takes place? 100% CG. Framestore created the entire building model, adding Tom Holland's mocap footage on top. They used a mocap suit instead of filming Tom in costume to save time on set. All of those reality-bending illusions would have meant way too many costume changes for just one sequence. That nightmare-inducing zombie Iron Man utilized mocap as well. Framestore went through several designs for the undead hero, finding the right balance to be horrifying without showing anything too gruesome. The final product finds a good middle ground, 
resembling a mummy beneath the broken bits of machinery. Marvel moviegoers are no stranger to the incredible holograms of this cinematic universe, which means the VFX teams have to keep their designs consistent with the Marvel style while putting in a few new twists to keep the visuals from getting stale for longtime fans. For this scene, where Mysterio is introduced as Quentin Beck and explains the elemental attacks, filming was done using a special light box table. Rising Sun Pictures had to not only design and place the holograms in the scene, but adjust the lighting and colors depending on which holograms were showing to make them look like they were really in the room with the actors. The work had to be done in layers, sometimes completely removing the lighting from on set. The lighting in the raw footage lacks the subtle colors reflecting from the holograms that don't just make the scene look pretty, but create an atmosphere to complement the actors' performances. Sometimes, an actor's job boils down to fighting invisible monsters on set. The scene with the water elemental battle was filmed on set with recreations of buildings from Venice on top of a huge pool of water and blue screens as backdrops. While the scene utilized a ton of CG, most of the stunts were accomplished by Tom and his stunt doubles, Luke Scott and Greg Townley. I never have a stunt double, it's always me. VFX not only hid the wires required to help Tom jump from pole to pole and vault onto the Rialto Bridge, but filled in the backgrounds of Venice and, of course, brought the water elemental to life. There were no rigs or dummies used for the monster, which means the actors had to rely on their imaginations to really sell their performances. All of that water they were drenched with was real, though, and very cold. Similar techniques were used for filming the scenes in London. While portions of the scenes set on Tower Bridge were filmed on location, they also filmed using set pieces such as the tour bus in front of green screens. The shots littered with rubble and broken down cars were set pieces in front of green screens too. For wide shots, Imageworks built a complete 3D model of Tower Bridge. This model was also used for filming all the destruction that took place during the climactic final battle. During all this action, we see tons of drones in various states of despair. Imageworks was able to create all of these broken bots by altering their original models. The drones were constructed out of various individual pieces, all coming together to form a single machine. Like the water elemental, the drones didn't use any objects on set as stand-ins to help the actors visualize the scene. Here's what Peter's final confrontation with Beck really looked like on set. Believe it or not, this scene set in a vibrant field of tulips was filmed in an empty grass lot in the UK. The jet and all the flowers were CG. Image Engine had to simulate an entire field of tulips with natural wind as well as the jet landing. Over two million tulips were simulated in this scene. There were eight colors and eight different tulips created for each color. In order to render all of them efficiently, they used a method called pre-caching, where software will download data ahead of time in anticipation of its use. That way, the computers weren't forced to simulate two million flowers at the same time. Stripped of CGI, this scene is just Tom Holland and Jon Favreau standing in some grass. Did you know Imageworks did VFX for all the previous Spider-Man movies? That's right, they provided effects for the original trilogy and The Amazing Spider-Man. Producers were actually reluctant to go to them again for the MCU installments since they wanted to give the third iteration of the hero a fresh new look. That was until they saw this test footage Imageworks whipped up to prove that they were up to the task. That's not Tom Holland in costume, that's completely CG. The 3D model looked and moved so convincingly that even Tom Holland himself was fooled. To innovate on their previous work, they focused on making MCU Spider-Man the most realistic one yet. They did this by studying imperfections in Tom's movements from unused takes and incorporating them into the animated Spider-Man. Moments of hesitation or getting caught off balance helped make the CG Spidey feel far more grounded in reality than any of the previous films. While some of Spidey's suits are completely computer-generated and require a mocap suit, even the costumes on set require digital tweaking here and there. It can be as simple as removing wrinkles to keep the suit looking smooth, or adding wear and tear from the intense action sequences. Following in Tony Stark's footsteps, Peter enters the workshop in the back of the jet to build his own suit for the first time since he ran around Queens in sweats. 
While the shots of Peter entering are all CG, there was also a physical set for the workshop. After filming Tom on set, the holograms were added in post with VFX. Image Engine had to create an exact replica of the set in order to accurately layer the holograms and moving machinery over the real footage, bringing the workshop to life in the final product. This scene isn't just an important character moment for Peter, but a chance for the audience to see what goes into building a Stark Tech Spidey suit. Image Engine had to decide what the individual elements of the suit would look like, ultimately breaking it down into three layers for the construction process. There's a white, wet fiber layer, a layer of black and red fabric detailing, and a layer for hard surfaces such as the eyepieces and chest patches. The company in charge of VFX for the final battle in London, Imageworks, kept these details consistent when adding battle damage to the suit. If we look at his suit closely during his emotional reunion with MJ, we can see patches of white material where the suit sustained damage. Behind the CGI of Venom, there are stunts, practical effects, and a ton of impressive acting. Venom is a really visually exciting movie to watch, especially because of the wild and shocking transformation we see Eddie undergo. The complex villain is brought to life thanks to some truly remarkable CGI. Behind the scenes is just as action-packed as the final cut of these films. Venom 2 definitely doesn't hold back on the wild action and impressive CGI work. These tendrils have a total life of their own in this shot, but behind the scenes, the carnage arm grab looks pretty different. Instead of real tendrils, wires and harnesses did the heavy lifting to make sure the cameras captured what they needed. The restricted spin around while being held by wires looks far from comfortable to deal with, but it was well worth it considering just how epic the final result looks. While Tom Hardy gives a great performance, the shape-shifting transformation we see on screen from man to supervillain is all thanks to painstakingly detailed CGI work. The VFX team actually created animations for every single frame we see. While it took a lot of time and expertise, it was the best way to make sure the transformation looked as slick and real as it does. Every layer of the detailed animation images contributes to making Venom's interactions with people and the world look so convincing. One of the coolest scenes in the first Venom takes to the streets with this massive mess of black tendrils moving from flat on the ground to a powerful stance. While his movements look flawless in the final cut, behind the scenes was a very different story as the actors were hard at work to perfect choreography to properly map out the movements. The CGI team needed the best footage to work with to bring Venom to the screen in such a central and powerful way. In the end, they definitely were not disappointed. The second Venom film features a pretty massive leap onto the hood of a car that's made to look like an effortless motion in post-production. But as we can see behind the scenes, a lot of prep had to be done and safety measures had to be considered for this superhuman moment. Seeing just how intense the stunt is without CGI is a great example of how much acting the performers need to do to appear as though these daunting tasks are totally effortless. Venom Let There Be Carnage is filled with plenty of shooting scenes which, of course, are no match for the creature. The drama of it all is still as present without CGI, considering the high stakes and loud noises. All the flashes of light and details to support the storytelling are courtesy of added effects, since they were just shooting blanks on the set. The living room sequence in the first Venom film is one of the most intense battles, in part because of the power imbalance. One versus three hardly seems fair, except for when the one actually turns out to be pretty fine on his own thanks to the power of Venom. The CGI in this scene is key for showing the surprising and powerful transformation Tom Hardy goes through. A whole lot of stage combat and practical effects contributed to executing the battle so well. As he slowly discovers the sheer amount of power he has, Tom Hardy looks a bit crazy staring down at his fist as if it were a monster. And to be fair, with the CGI, monstrous is a pretty good descriptor for what we end up seeing. Part of what makes the CGI so effective is the fact that Hardy performed each of these scenes with 100% commitment, especially when he was embodying Venom. The motorcycle chase scene is one of the most complicated sequences shot for the first film, and an epic point of action. While the scene itself only lasts a few minutes, before filming even commenced, 
planning happened for months to make sure it could all be carried out efficiently while making sure the epic footage was still captured. What's even crazier is that the whole chase was actually filmed, and CGI was what managed to weave the whole scene together seamlessly, and with impressive detail no less. Stunt doubles took over for the actual riding on the streets. Robbie Madison and Joe Dryden performed legendary motorbike stunts. Considering all the planning, it's no surprise about 40 cars ended up being used and inevitably destroyed over the course of filming. While CGI did amp up the look of this nosedive through flames, stunt performer Dryden really did whip through fire to make sure the team had the best shot they could get. To be perfected, of course, with special effects. We get to see the Venom tendrils in full force when they bring Hardy's character to safety. Well, as safe as someone can be whipping through the city on a motorcycle. Filming in studio saw the actor maneuvered by a harness to move from floating in the air to regaining control. But the moment CGI came into play was when the scene really came to life. Robbie Madison looked danger straight in the face when he was preparing for the huge jump on the famously steep Bullet Hill. This was actually the performer's very first jump in America, and was it ever a cool one? Since the team was limited in how many times the stunt could be performed, they needed CGI to make sure the scene looked good in the movie. After three stunt jumps, Madison was able to really hear the sounds of the cars crashing and the intensity of the whole experience hit him. The effects added in post made the jump look even more legendary. For the Wicked Motorcycle Sandwich, the performers were in real cars and Hardy was actually on top of a motorcycle. But the whole scene was filmed while the vehicles were stationary. Filming with a blue screen behind them, Hardy had some good opportunities to really perform well on the motorbike, and all the while not having to worry about his own safety. The CGI fills in the blank adding the scenery and effects to amplify the intensity of this moment. This motorcycle slide is nothing short of impressive. The two weeks spent to create a specially designed metal plate for the motorcycle to attach to in order to safely whip around with such speed was well worth the effort. The experience of filming was pretty wild, and the final result adds a really cool, unexpected moment to the whole sequence. The visual details of Venom really complete the masterpiece. This apartment fight was pretty wicked and included the vicious weight-throwing move. Luckily, the actors weren't in any actual danger since there weren't any real weights on the set. CGI isn't just used for big explosions and out-of-this-world creatures. Sometimes generating images for more typical or practical effects is what's needed. With major throws come a whole lot of wires and harnesses. While in the first movie we see exactly what outer force throws him around, behind the scenes it almost looks a bit more like magic since Hardy was hooked up to wires and harnesses, making sure the tricky stunts could be filmed safely. It looks incredible in rehearsal, so it's no surprise that the final product is a gem as well. Slamming into the wall over and over again can't have been the most comfortable experience for the actor though. There were a fair number of window jumps in the first Venom film. Some simple leaps from inside a corridor shattering glass in the midst, and in other cases, epic leaps through the air. In both cases, CGI played a key role, filling in the scenery and making performers look like they're really soaring. Especially when it came to all the Venom detailing. Cut. One more, one more, one more! One more, still wrong. Ready? 25 million per episode and over 2,496 shots with visual effects in the series. How did WandaVision do it? The series shows an array of genres, from varied decades to drama to total slapstick comedy. So what did that mean behind the scenes? What were the secrets behind the magic? We'll be covering how the production brought magic to the screen and what it was really like for the performers experiencing it. It's been really fun and different. However, if you haven't watched the whole series yet, approach with caution. Yes. Yes! Avengers Endgame had 2,496 shots with visual effects, and Paul Bettany, aka Vision, has confirmed that WandaVision had even more. How is this even possible considering how extensive the effects are for the action-packed film? Well, the movie runs just over three hours, whereas the total running time of all the WandaVision episodes is a bit over five and a half hours. Not to mention, multiple decades and this fantastic transformation from a grayscale world to color. At the end of the day, a greater variety and amount of VFX were needed to suit the vision of the show. 
We should also mention that there were a whopping 10 different effects companies that contributed to WandaVision. Five and a half hours of content, 10 VFX companies, and about $225 million spent on the entire series. Yeah, we can see how over 2,500 VFX shots make sense. I'll give you the role you chose. As the series continued, we got to see more and more of the Marvel magic that we're used to. And they didn't shy away from it when Wanda was in the town square surrounded by the townspeople of Westview. Watching this scene without all the effects and Wanda's red power blasting through the hex is definitely different, but the sheer scale of it all is still really impressive. Then of course, we all got to revel in the power of the Scarlet Witch. Naturally, they couldn't really have glowing red surrounding her entirely, but this green screen did the trick. Olsen's delicate and powerful hand motions really do their job in making this magic look real. Add the glowing eyes, and she is set. Olsen is no stranger to wire work, and thank goodness because she had plenty of it in WandaVision. She looks so calm, cool, and collected as she descends down into the square here. I don't understand this power. And how about those epic battle scenes? Olsen said that this may actually be the first time Marvel had a full battle sequence taking place entirely in the air. Take note of how many wires there are all over these shots. The rigging is definitely no small task. Thank goodness CGI is able to edit out all of the tricks of the trade used to make the magic. Though not everything needed a highly technical VFX. Adding some of this magic was as simple as, well, cue the giant fans for Agatha. It may have been her first time in the MCU and defying gravity, but she looks like she's totally in her element here. As we can see, she wasn't holding back one bit and seemed to really revel in the magic of it all. How about these tense moments where the actors appeared to simply be levitating without all the wild movement and soaring through the air? Well, as we can see here, Olsen was essentially placed in a concoction of wires to hold her up and floating in Agatha's chamber. It doesn't look too comfortable, but the final result? Well, it speaks for itself. Let's let Agnes give it a try. For a human playing a synthesoid, Bettany does an incredible job as Vision. However, credit has to be given to the VFX team who did an incredible job at using CGI for his face as well. Yes, he spends hours in the makeup chair and gets a whole lot of prosthetics done, but to really bring the vision of Vision to life, a team effort is needed. The acting, emotion, and heart? That's all Bettany. But his face is often CGI'd and augmented with effects. His ears are really the main part CGI'd out of the shot as we can see here. Notice how detailed each layer that is added is? Each line on his head, every ridge and texture is added to really perfect the look. Let's also take a minute to acknowledge how flawlessly he moves when he's flying. Have you ever seen a more graceful sweep? And then of course, we all got to experience double vision. Not too shabby. I wish to understand it. Tiana Paris actually had no idea that she was auditioning to play Monica Rambeau. And when she found out, well, let's just say she was thrilled. So thrilled, she even nearly tested her superpowers on the spot. Practically tried to jump off a set of stairs because I thought I could fly. I was so excited. Luckily, she waited until she was on set to try to find gravity. Though, flying isn't nearly as impressive as what her character actually went through. Remember when Wanda blasted her out of the hex? Well, fortunately, Paris didn't have to bear the brunt of Wanda's upset. Instead, it was a three-dimensional figure based on Paris that was computer-generated and then added to the shots in After VFX. Though the intense rejection wasn't quite enough to keep her out of the hex and mesmerized us with the incredible transition through static and memory. What were those digital graphics inspired by exactly anyway? Not to worry, we'll be getting to that soon. Last one to town square is a walking pair of Bonji. The Hex is probably one of the most powerful forces we've ever seen at play in the MCU. We were majorly impressed by the fact that the team managed to augment the invisible barrier so intricately. This of course took loads of CGI. The main idea behind the visuals of the Hex was fairly obvious for the team. Television. What else could suit the show better? The waves and graphics that we see used here reflect what magnetization looked like across a screen, what pixelation looked like when super zoomed into old-fashioned TVs, as well as the thin lines often seen on those old TVs. It was all a reflection of the evolution of television technology. Everything might look fake in the TV, but everything in there is real. Turning the sword base into a circus? Well, let's just call it a very apt metaphor. Check out what this setting looked like before and after the CGI. Accomplishing this transformation actually wasn't too difficult according to the VFX specialists. It was as simple as filming both settings and then using CGI to augment each one. 
One of the best compliments a VFX or CGI person can receive is that people had no idea that some of what's seen on screen is actually created by computers. One of the more subtle and surprising CGI touches was the stage found in the town square. At first glance, we thought this gazebo-like building was the same one used by Wanda and Vision when they perform in the talent show. But seeing this slightly different looking structure in this later episode, we realize it's not any type of building at all, but a blue screen. This is one of those instances where we really had to see it to believe it. A very small detail, but it proves to us just how much magic there is. Who knew this seemingly simple frame would be one of the over 2,500 with added effects? No, abracadabra! It wasn't all too serious on set though. The cast definitely had their fair share of fun, especially with so many key players like Tayana Paris, Deborah Jo Rupp, and Katherine Hahn joining the MCU for the very first time. We just love how enthusiastic Rupp was about having her body scan done for CGI. Honestly, we'd probably be just as excited. Han was enjoying herself so much that she even made some entrances way earlier than she needed to. It's okay though, we wanted all the Agatha we could get. But it wasn't just the newbies who had a wild time. Olsen herself started to push it in the episode that she goes through an entire pregnancy in a day and went a bit too over the top. Granted, Wanda's hormones were going wild at that point. Or maybe it had something to do with that wig. Here we are, behind the scenes, with Loki. There is no denying the magnetic appeal of Loki. Tom Hiddleston's incredible performance gets most of the credit, but even he needs help bringing the trickster god to life on film. To celebrate Loki getting his very own series, we're giving you a look at some behind-the-scenes magic of how Marvel brings the god of mischief to the screen in all his glory. Loki is still working on that, I think. For this scene from Thor The Dark World, the first thing they filmed was Tom Hiddleston doing an impression of Captain America as Loki, complete with Cap's costume. There wasn't a technical reason for this, apparently Tom just really wanted to wear the costume. It's not gonna be you though, we're gonna get Chris to shoot it when he's on set and we're gonna... And he said, no, 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 this is my one chance to wear a Captain America suit. Later, Evans was shown the footage and did his best to mimic Tom's performance, replacing it in the final product. He, it's him doing an impression of me, doing an impression of him, and it's brilliant. A good villain needs a grand entrance, and Loki certainly doesn't disappoint. Loki's entrance in the first Avengers movie is a memorable one, thanks in no small part to the VFX team. Even without the final polish and the wires still in sight, this shot of Tom performing this stunt is just as impressive as the finished shot from the movie, where Loki leaps through the air and takes down a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Always try and enjoy myself, to be having the best time. Speaking of dramatic entrances, this scene from the first episode of Loki where he's being processed by the TVA was achieved with a real trap door and Tom Hiddleston on wires. He was hooked up to a rig to achieve a controlled drop, ensuring his safety as they filmed the stunt. Luckily, Tom already has a lot of experience doing wire work since Loki always seems to be getting tossed around. Just me jumping into <laughs> trenches in the set. Creating that iconic scene where Loki gets Hulk smashed was tricky. You can't exactly do that with stunt work. To pull this off, Tom had a wire attached to his ankle with a mat on the floor to catch him. And three of the strongest stunt guys holding the wire at the other end. They waited to interrupt his villainous monologue and yanked hard, pulling Tom out of frame and down onto the mat. The rest was done with hard work from the special effects department. The experience of being yanked out of frame was one I will not forget in a hurry. Loki and Thor's banter in this scene from Thor The Dark World where they break out of Asgard is unforgettable, as well as a brilliant mix of practical and special effects. Chris and Tom filmed this scene on a set of the ship's interior, with special effects creating the holographic interfaces and adjusting the lighting accordingly. While Thor practically throws Loki out the door, Chris gives Tom a light shove, who then has to throw himself out of the door onto a mat below. I mentioned I love my scenes with Chris. In every film, there's a two-hander where we kind of touch on this. Odin's emotional departure in Thor Ragnarok took place on a beautiful, scenic cliffside that doesn't actually exist. These scenes were filmed in a grassy field, with the future locations of New Asgard being entirely built around them using CGI. Another surprising use of digital effects in this scene is Odin's eye patch, which was changed in post from the plain black eye patch Anthony Hopkins wore while filming. Yeah, dead easy. Well, it's a trick. 
Dramatic entrances probably run in the family, because as soon as Hela arrives on the scene, you know she means business. Thor and Loki immediately know she's going to be trouble and suit up. To get this magical costume change, Chris and Tom were filmed entering in both costumes. The footage was spliced together, and the effects team created Thor's lightning and Loki's signature green shimmer of magic to create a transition between these changes, putting them together for one seamless shot. Loki was a bad guy. <laughs> Well, uh, Loki was a misunderstood guy. We love seeing the Odin sons work together, like when they teamed up in the Dark World. Using Loki's illusion magic, they fooled Malekith into believing Loki had betrayed Thor, going as far as pretending to cut off Thor's hand and give up Jane Foster. It's very accurate. <laughs> in this shot, Loki literally kicks Thor while he's down, sending him rolling. On set, it was Hiddleston, delivering a kick that didn't connect, and Hemsworth was pulled away using wires. Never was torturous at all, so <clears throat> I'm incredibly proud of this. While there were parts of Thor and Loki's confrontation with Malekith that were filmed on location in Iceland, taking advantage of some barren, volcanic landscapes, the more effects-heavy shots were filmed on a green screen set. This behind-the-scenes footage really gives you an appreciation for the amount of faith actors have to put into their directors and their special effects team. There's an art to the physicality of performances, with invisible elements like CGI magic, and Tom pulls it off beautifully. While it may look silly on set, the final product was anything but. It can be surprising exactly which elements of a scene are created using CGI. Like Loki's chains in The Avengers. Yeah, for whatever reason, those were CGI, not part of Tom's costume like they were for Thor The Dark World. Loki's restraints and muzzle add a lot of context to these shots, so the behind-the-scenes footage of the closing scene looks pretty different without them. Props to Tom for being able to convincingly move like someone in chains, even limiting how much he moved his mouth and jaw. I think, well, there was always going to be an unanswered question mm -hmm. of what on earth happened. Getting Hulk smashed became an Odinson tradition in Thor Ragnarok when Thor faced off against Hulk in the arena. Loki, clearly still holding on to some baggage from his fight with Hulk, is thrilled to see Thor get the same treatment. Of course, Tom didn't actually have a spectacular fight to react to. You would never guess that the only thing he's really looking at is a room full of cameras and crew. In the first Avengers movie, Thanos uses one of his followers, referred to as the Other, to keep an eye on Loki and monitor his progress conquering Earth. The final cut only kept one of their conversations in, with some horrific implications that Loki was being threatened with torture. But there were several more exchanges between the two that got left out. These deleted scenes are unfinished, but give us an idea of what the raw filming process looked like. While The Other himself was achieved with practical effects, played by Alexis Denisoff in Sculpts and Makeup, the alien world he hangs out in when speaking to Loki was mostly blue screen. They followed me into some interesting corners. In the first Thor movie, we meet the Frost Giants, and later learn that Loki was originally the son of their king, not Odin. Most of the Frost Giants, or Jotuns as they're also called, were filmed using practical effects. The actors would spend hours having sculpts and makeup applied to them to achieve just the right look. But this lengthy process wouldn't have been practical for Tom's brief scenes in Loki's Jotun skin. Instead, his red eyes and blue skin were added in post. As soon as I look in the mirror after I've been through, it's like, wow. Ever wonder why Loki's helmet has changed so many times since the first Thor movie? Even putting on the helmet was more complicated than you think, since Tom couldn't just pull it on over his head. The final product used in Thor actually had to come apart in two pieces, which would be snapped together to encase Tom's head. According to him, it was like having his brain cooked. All of his body heat would build up under the helmet, driving him a bit mad, which he says he used to fuel his performance. That's probably why we see a lot less of it in The Avengers, and it didn't return until Thor Ragnarok, with a more minimalist redesign. You have to be careful what you let in in, because you can, that can sort of spill into what you're doing. Last but not least is this deleted scene from Thor. It's a fun character moment where Loki gets to cause some mischief. After being mocked and laughed at, Loki gets even by turning a goblet of wine into snakes. The effects are unfinished, and there's even some shots where lighting rigs are still visible. Props to this extra who had to convincingly react to a magical prank that wasn't actually happening. We just look at it as creatives and say, look at all of these things we could play with. When you're working on movies as crazy as Venom and its recent sequel, of course you're dealing with a whole lot of CGI. But did you know there are tricks to making it look so sexy and smooth? 
Let's take a look behind the VFX curtain at Let There Be Carnage. Why do I even talk to you guys? Everywhere else that story kills. That's the whole story? Yes. Now that Tom Hardy's Eddie Brock and the symbiote are more in sync and working as Venom, this film freed up Tom Hardy to really go nuts. New director Andy Serkis wanted to give the actor the freedom to move around without having to worry about putting a man in a suit, be it mocap or monster on screen. Since Venom is coming out of Hardy, it made more sense to have him skip the mocap and layer the monstrous side of Venom right over the actor. According to Circus, I've spent a considerable amount of my life playing a character with two sides to his personality. I knew that this film would be about how to free up Tom to imagine Venom's presence. We knew it would not be helpful for him to act opposite a man in a suit, because Venom is a symbiote coming out of him. We wanted to give Tom the freedom in his process to give the performance he wanted. Hardy has also weighed in on this decision, saying in an interview for Total Film that the decision to not worry about mocap was an easy one. Given the difference in height between himself and Venom, as well as the extreme flexibility of the creature's face and limbs, saying, So the mocap treatment went out the window pretty quickly. Facially, your eyes and teeth and tongue are not going to match with this. And you need a seven foot tall basketball player in a lycra suit for the physical shots. How do we, you know, move this around? Not just necessarily with uh, animation or CGI or motion capture, but as an actor. You've got to be willing to look a little nuts when you're pretending to be a seven foot tall monster who eats people's heads. Since the production chose to have Hardy physically on set and doing stunt work for many of the film's action sequences, the actor had to dig deep into his history of playing toughs and heavies, as well as his more reactive, animalistic performances like Max Rokotansky in Mad Max Fury Road and James Kazaya Delaney in Taboo. Just in case, you know, it's successful, which you hope it is, and you put everything into it. One of the biggest changes going into Venom 2 was the decision to replace departing director Ruben Fleischer with Andy Serkis, having made a name for himself working with Weta to bring characters like Gollum, King Kong, and the Planet of the Apes' Caesar to life. The guy is still the undisputed king of detailed motion capture performances. Even though the film shies away from motion capture, he was still an excellent voice to have on set, as he could help to block out scenes and accommodate for the height differences between his actors and the creatures they were portraying. In fact, Circus received a call to consult on the film, though he didn't know it at the time. Tom Hardy gave Circus a call and said, Andy, I'm going to be doing this character, and it's going to be a digital character, and I wondered if I could come down to the Imaginarium, which is a performance capture studio in the UK. But then Circus didn't hear from him again for a while, and it wasn't until Venom came out that he realized Hardy was talking about Venom. He really had to act in this movie. He really is a big character. One of the wildest things about watching the new Venom is checking out Woody Harrelson as Cletus Cassidy. As Cassidy, Harrelson is taking huge, wild swings to portray the serial killer imbuing him with a larger-than-life personality as he tears his way through San Francisco, surfs on cars, and generally looks like he's having a blast the whole time. I just didn't feel like I was free enough to be more creative. Here's an incredible bit of stunt work for you. That motorcycle stunt where Eddie goes flying during a massive jump? Well, it turns out that it was really mostly him. The production set up the jump, and then put both the bike and Hardy on wires, moving them together and apart on a green screen, and then adding the CGI tendrils later. Windows get smashed, and motorbikes, and all kinds of things that, that happen. One of the things that the sequel really amps up from the first film is the incredible, dysfunctional domestic relationship between Eddie and the symbiote, treating them more like an old married couple than a crime-fighting duo. This is on full, glorious display during the scenes set in Eddie's apartment where the effects team connected props, furniture, and sometimes whole actors to cables, so that the objects were moving through a physical space and could be embellished with Venom's many CGI tendrils later on. And yes, that includes Sonny and Cher, Eddie and Venom's pet chickens who were played by live animals. There's an enormous amount of humor to be had out of this entire scene something that's sure to give you flashbacks to playing racing games when you were little. 
Apparently, Tom Hardy has a habit on set of making his own sound effects when he was getting hit or throwing punches, and even as he was getting his nose broken by the symbiote, something that puts him in the grand tradition of actors who can't stop making sounds on set, like Harrison Ford in the original Star Wars. I take orders from just one person, me. Sometimes there's not a whole lot to do but fake an entire scene, such as this one where Cletus Cassidy transforms fully into Carnage. Background locations, props, the monster, even Cassidy himself were all rendered digitally, giving us a cool and gnarly look at the musculature of a symbiote suit when it puts itself together. Sometimes fate and timing are against you, and you have to make certain concessions to the movie gods. For example, this scene with Cassidy in the car was originally supposed to be filmed as a larger stunt on location. Except, well, a little movie called The Matrix Resurrections was shooting in town at the same time, and they got the location first. Instead, the scene with the suspended car was rigged against blue screens and large projection screens to recreate the city skyline. You know, that's cool because I, I sure enjoyed playing them and I, I'm glad I got to do this. There seems to be one little trick to shooting an animation scene in a Venom movie. All you do is attach a string or a suspension harness to literally everything in the shot, and then you pull and wiggle everything around, like these poor stunt guys in the scene where Carnage and Cassidy escape from prison. As I walked around, I felt like the king. Of course, it wouldn't be a movie released in 2021 if we didn't talk about a little bit of pandemic delay. Shooting on the film finished early on, but due to release delays, Andy Serkis and his team were blessed with a ton of extra time to tweak the edit of the film and more closely oversee the CGI work. It takes a lot to create truly convincing CGI. Back in the days of black and white films, Production designers had to work carefully to pick outlandish colors that would still pop together and be distinguishable when reduced to a grayscale. But Venom 2 is a testament to the fact you still need to be careful. To create the illusion of this symbiote goo actually coming out of the actors and seeping through their clothes, picking placement and really reactive colors was a must. Finally, here's a little bit of revenge for you. There are several large night scenes in Venom 2 where there are a bunch of helicopters flying around in the background. They don't really impact anything, but they add a certain scope to the scene. So you might be forgiven for thinking that they're CGI. Not true, though. They're actually helicopters that were flying around a nearby location for the shoot of, you guessed it, The Matrix Resurrections. Sweet, free helicopters. A film of this scale, this piece of grand entertainment, blockbuster material with a predominantly black cast, I mean, it just hasn't been done before. Say what you want about Tom Hardy, it takes a lot of talent to be able to play off an invisible alien that lives inside of you. 